Our next one would be Detective Sandanaga, S A N D A N A G A. A detective. Okay. It's about twenty minutes. All right. Let's go ahead and okay. have that witness. And is that and go ahead. We start the question. All right. Thank you. I'm actually curious about this. Now we have a real fucking detective. Okay. Is here your we go. Name and business address for the record, please. Bro, this looks like an AI generated Marie character. Sandanaga, M A R I E. What the hell? Sadanaga, S A D A N A G A. And my business address is 100 West First Street, Los Angeles, California. And what is your current occupation? I looks am like a detective yeah. with the Los Angeles Police Department, and I am the department's domestic violence coordinator. Okay, all right, here we go. What does it mean to be the domestic violence coordinator? For the so I am recognized as. The person most knowledgeable in domestic violence, I oversee how our department as a whole responds to domestic violence. So I don't investigate cases right now myself. Uh -huh. I just make sure that officers and detectives are responding to domestic violence, how California State Penal Code wants us to. So she's the manager. The 17 years. What, if any, policies, procedures, and protocols are in place at the LAPD for domestic violence cases separate from other types? Okay. So once we determine there is domestic violence, uh, if we have to determine whether there is a crime. Every time we respond to a domestic violence call, Per state law, we need to document whether it's a crime or just an incident, which would oh, be okay. when there is not a crime, but there's still paperwork done. So that is part of the officer's investigation. All right. Now, I had asked a little earlier about when the victim is reluctant to press charges. If the patrol officers mm -hmm. saw property damage or marks on the face of the victim, even if the victim was not cooperating and did not want to press charges, what would the patrol officer's obligations be? They would back have in to May report 2016 it. on a domestic violence call. If officers determined that there was domestic violence, uh -huh. even if a victim is reluctant, our policy is they still make that arrest if a suspect is there or take a report. So, if there are well, when well, well, officers arrive at the scene, and this is May 2016, mm -hmm. and there are four people that are present at the scene, how many of those individuals are the patrol officers obligated to interview? So I'm going to show you the incident call here, and it, it mm -hmm. goes down and it has domestic dispute. And then it says, met with victim, looks like uh -huh. check location, verified husband left, victim advised verbal dispute, and refused to give any further information, issued business card. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Why well, I heard it's bringing this woman in? Yeah, I know. May of 2016. I don't understand it either. Was the language victim advised verbal dispute language that was that okay. patrol officers were trained to provide when they were not going to document anything from the scene it can vary but officers would commonly use um uh -huh. the phrase verbal dispute or to document when a report was not taken okay I'm going to ask you to take a look at what has been marked as deposition exhibit number eight. It's dated November 24, it. 2014. And it's subject domestic violence supplemental report. And it says the domestic violence supplemental report form 15.40.02 has been revised to provide a more concise picture of the history and needs of the victim for the purpose of investigating the crime of domestic violence. You see that? Boy. Yes. What is your understanding of why the, the, the LAPD decided that they needed to 
create a, a supplemental report form that would give a more concise picture picture of the history and needs of the victim for the purpose of investigating the crime of domestic violence. Right. Yeah. Uh, supplemental includes a lot of questions that are required by California state law. Okay. And so we included that on it and the original supplemental was actually created a lot earlier, I believe in 1999. This um, this revision of it okay. uh, added some specific questions uh, to help us look at, kind of to do a risk assessment. Um, I'm not sure that if the sense. supplemental is attached to this form. Yeah, sure. On the supplemental, there's a section where I believe there's like seven yes or no questions. That is what was added during this revision. Mm -hmm. The reviewer to discredit the officers went to check on Amber. I'm going yeah. to show you what has been marked as deposition exhibit number nine. And do you recognize this supplemental report? Yes. I, is this the supplemental form that was referred to in exhibit number eight? Yes. Is there what? a scenario under which the patrol officers decide that there's no crime, but they see property well, damage and injury and take photographs? I mean, it, every situation is different. Um, yeah. I believe well, one way, if we have a situation like that that occurred, it, then there should be a domestic violence incident report. So mm -hmm. there is a place to uh, document your observations and statements from people and, and a reason to have those photographs. Okay. Even if ultimately the officers determined that it wasn't a crime. And yes, that's why domestic violence incident reports are reports where there are no crime. And that is why we have them so we can we can document um, and have a history of calls and see in case there is another call in the future that there is prior history of any type of, of domestic call, even if it was not ultimately ruled the crime. Would that incident report okay. uh, include if there were interviews with witnesses and if there were any photographs or notes taken? Yes, there is still a narrative that is that is written where everything, the officer's investigation and observations and any photographs are listed. And well, they have body cam was proof. there an incident report in place in May of 2016 for patrol officers to use in domestic violence calls. Yes. Could you please describe the purpose of an incident report as of May 2016? And okay. What was included typically in an incident report? So the purpose of domestic violence incident reports um, were to record when officers responded to a call of domestic violence did, that did not result in a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, they are actually required by state law for us to document uh, every domestic violence incident that we respond to. And in that report, it's that the same, mm. Mm -mm. I keep calling it a face sheet. That's not the official term, but the same as a, a crime report that we would take it no. on, but you fill out the information. You just do not list a suspect because we have no crime. It's the victim who was in fear that the other party may cause um, some type of uh, danger to them. And that other party is then listed as a witness. And then there is a narrative that oh, wow. is included, uh, the same type of narrative that would be in a crime report where no. you would write down your source of activity, well, the officers would put their source of activity no. and then document their investigation. Um, the statements that anyone made, um, any, as we ask on domestic violence calls, what type of relationship it is, how mm. long, you know, they've been together, any prior incidents of domestic violence, um, 
all that would be included in the narrative of an incident report. And would any photographs uh, or other notes also be included in that incident report? Yes, they can be. If there was anything that they saw that officers believe needed to be documented in there. Yep. All right. And where I'm ready. would an incident report, and I'm again back in May 2016. I'm ready. Where would that be filed pop or off. stored? Let me once pop off the now. Patrol officers were done with their shift for the day. Uh, the officers would turn in their uh, reports, including any incident reports, mm. to the watch commander who would read over it and sign it off. And mm. if it is approved, it would go to our Come records on, unit bro. at that Ooh. division to create a, so um, a report number on it. And then it does get um, assigned to a detective mm -hmm. just so that we have it on uh, file. Mm -hmm. Um, in in case there's any future incidents. As do officers at some point have to make a determination as to whether domestic violence has occurred? Yes, they do. Of course. Okay. What criteria do officers use to make that evaluation? They use the interviews with the parties that are there. Um, okay. What they observe at the scene. Um, even what they observe, like the demeanor of the victims and the suspects, uh, every situation is different, but it's uh, really like taking in the whole, the whole 360 of where you are and what's occurring so down. they can get all information. We're going to compare it. Educated determination of the crimes occurred. Can you just generally describe for me the circumstances under which a domestic uh, incident report is used? Oh, we take uh, a um, that, uh, incident report. Oh boy. When there, we determine there oh is no boy. crime, but that one of the parties is in fear that uh, you know their life was in danger or they could um, be a victim of some type of serious bodily injury. So, they, the third incidents you would have or where we don't take the incident report is where mm. both parties state it was an argument uh there was no physical injury i wasn't both parties say we aren't weren't afraid that the other was going to do any type of harm to me okay and so in that case in that third case that you just described mm -hmm. would there be any documentation required typically on the that third one yeah. when we don't have the fear so it makes it no incident report it's only documented on that um, daily field activity report this might have asked a line of questions earlier on okay. in the deposition right. about victims of domestic violence being reluctant to come forward oh and my up. god yes is that a significant problem in dealing with domestic violence calls? Yes. Oh is that my a God! You personally experienced on on your Shoot own calls. Johnny, it is. Yes. Okay. Um. When confronted with a person who is unwilling to make a statement. Yeah. Um, is there much that a police officer can really do um, if you have if you have somebody who just refuses to make a statement and refuses to indicate that they have suffered violent abuse? It's uh, not too much. Usually, um, we try to, we teach them to talk about uh, the cycle of violence and power and control and see if we can so, you know, start a rapport with the victim and get them to discuss. But if they really don't want to tell us what happened, we can't force them. Yeah. If, if a uh, potential victim has visible injuries yes, or that there are indications at the scene 
that there has been some sort of violent episode, does the fact that the potential victim declines to make a statement mean that the officers can't go forward? No, probably not. No. Yeah. Not necessarily. Is um, they would need to investigate more, but you do have the visible injury and you know evidence of some type of uh, struggle. So they would need to try to get that probable cause to determine that it was a crime that created that injury. There so there is no injury. Of questions asked. Uh, about so. If I mean, observed injury, if observed property damage, back and forth, and both of us have asked you a lot of questions about this, um, and so I just want to make sure that it's very clear. Okay. If a police officer responding to a domestic violence call sees injury, regardless of whether the victim cooperates, what is the police officer's obligation? This is as of May 2016. To do an investigation to determine if that injury was a result of a crime. Okay. What and does an investigation mean? That investigation would include what? It would uh, include interviewing anyone that is at scene, um, seeing if there's any type of physical evidence of uh, altercation or depending on, on the story that was given, if there's corroboration of that, um, seeing if there's any witnesses. Okay. Um, yeah. Kind of depends. Each, yeah. each one's different, but just doing a thorough investigation. If one of the other witnesses Bro. took the officers through the entire uh, premises right, and like, showed broken glass, spilled glass. wine, and a number of areas of disturbance and vandalism, what would the officers' obligations be then? The officers would still need to determine if, uh, if there was enough evidence there from from these witness statements and the things that they're seeing to determine uh -huh. if this injury is a result of a crime. What discretion do the police officers have when they see an injury on the victim when they report it to a domestic violence call? And this is in May 2016. Okay. The officers still need to do an investigation if there is a visible injury because we they have to determine if it was a crime. So one of your roles, if I understand it, is to make a determination of that the police, the LAPD as a whole, uh, how you're overseeing how they respond to domestic violence calls, correct? Leader. Yes. And I, let me ask it just a little bit differently. In making the determination of whether to create an incident report, uh, what, if any, factors can the officer consider uh, if the victim does not want to press charges? but the officer still believes that an incident report is appropriate under the circumstances. Oh boy. It would, if a officer determines that there was not a crime yet, there was enough there and guess what I'm trying to say? I mean, the purpose we have to think about that we tell the officers the purpose of domestic violence incident report is for documentation of incidents because we know with domestic violence there's usually a series of of incidents that happen and not all of those are crimes so right for us as officers we document those so in the future if there is a crime we can go back and say there have been all these other incidents yeah so as officers we want to take smart. that uh into our analysis of the scene and if we can't determine whether a crime has happened we have to yeah. think about do do we need to document this so maybe sometime in the future people know that this happened. Uh-huh. Please take lunch. Thank you. 
Food. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take our lunch break at this time. All right. Again, do not do any outside research and do not discuss the case with anybody, okay? We'll see you back. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Gentlemen, we are about to talk about about this situation. We're about to talk to, to talk about this little uh, thing that happened. So this was, in my opinion, one of the most uh, damning uh, things that, like, for, for Amber Heard's team. I think it, it's the most damning. I'll explain why. So let's fucking talk about this shit. All right, number one, why did they not freak out whenever they first showed up? Well, it's because the first phone call, we saw what happened. We saw what it was. It's not like this is some like, oh, well, you know, he said, she said, this is the testimony. We saw what happened. And this is what happened. They called and then they said, well, we don't know who called. And so, yeah, a report didn't get filed because it was an inauthentic call. Like, the entire premise was wrong. Well, what I'm saying is that there was no report that was filed because it was done and the officers were there on the pretense that it was a inauthentic call. So it's like nothing was really that fucked up. They, they let them around. They're like, ah, you know, it, things are fucked up. But like, it's not really that big of a deal. Like, they were really chill. Everybody was fucking chill. And the woman there even said that one of the different measures that they use is the temperament of the people that were around the situation. And you saw the temperament of those people. They were completely fucking fine. They were just relaxed. The guy had his shoes off. He's, you know, sitting there in his pajamas. And they're just sitting around. And also, like, in that apartment, there's a million fucking things everywhere. Like, bro, if somebody went wild, like, there would be so much glass everywhere. And, and so also, like, let's talk about that, right? So they interviewed the people, and I think that the police officers, they, um... Uh, they did everything in the exact way that the woman described it in terms of the protocol. Exactly. TMZ leaked the files. Delicious. We'll look at that in just a second, okay? So they looked at what they observed on the scene. They didn't see any observation of violence whatsoever. Nothing bad like that happened. The demeanor of all the people surrounding there was completely okay. And also the party that was affected was not in fear, which she said is one of the indicators in which they are going to conduct a thorough investigation. And also, they even said if the if the not villain, excuse me, if the victim is unable to make a statement, then she even said there's not much you can do. And you know what? Amber Heard wasn't willing to make a statement. There's not much that they could do. And so what happens is they look at her and they say, is there any injury? Is there any visible injury? And by the officer that was there, uh, she said that there was no uh, injury. And because there's no injury, she, she uh, implied or actually stated that because there's no injury, no further investigation is required under the law. And on top of that first call, they search and there's nothing broken. Yes, I know that. Um, was insurance the stuff they planted for exactly well even that was bad and that's what I'm really trying to get at right so like even that happened yeah no victim no crime exactly a and so she was not willing to make a statement there was no visible injuries and they still did look around they talked to people and they looked to see if there was an injury she was not bleeding so that would mean that obviously it probably wasn't a fresh injury or anything like that that's probably what they assumed and that was about it and also she even said that whenever she talked to the people that the witness statements from the people that were there would take precedent over the overall demeanor of the area because the people that were there actually saw it so like if the if the place is a fucking wreck and the people there are just relaxed well they're going to assume that the place is was a wreck like yesterday it was a wreck earlier it's not a wreck because of this so that's what happened so that's why the police officers didn't it, it didn't trigger any alarm bills uh bells excuse me is because all the people there you saw the interview you saw it Nobody there was freaking out. Nothing of, the, nothing of the sort happened. So they interviewed them, and they thought that because the interviews were understandable, these people were calm, everything was fine and relaxed, that the destruction in the area was not an outcome of the violence uh, dispute that, by the way, was considered uh, not even necessarily authentic by the police because they didn't know who really made the call, and that was confirmed by the witnesses. So big fucking surprise. Big fucking surprise. The cops leave.
I think the cops actually, I know this sounds crazy. We're in America. The cops did their job and they followed the protocol. Can you fucking believe that? Wow. When does this ever happen? Well, apparently it happened this time. Yeah, look at this. It seems like, yeah, no damage. Second call equals damage. Uh, Johnny Depp was gone two hours ago. Exactly. Uh, don't forget Amber, it's friend and testament that she was catatonic each time that Johnny allegedly hit her. Yeah, sure. Uh, exactly. And uh, it, it's... Yeah, I wonder why. They staged the mess in the apartment and took pictures afterwards. Yeah, but the, even because they staged the mess, even in that context, the, the woman there said that the statements from the witnesses and the people that were there take precedent over the way that like the demeanor of the house right uh how messy or how fucked up the house is because they don't know how things got fucked up they could have been fucked up before then you see what i'm saying that's why i always didn't show some images yes exactly uh cop actually went above and beyond by leaving a card that wasn't required that's a good point you're you're absolutely right Yep, there you fucking go. But they're playing on people's distrust of the police. <sighs> and isn't that a disgusting thing? Isn't that a disgusting thing that somebody who actually goes, uh, you know, above and beyond, who tries to actually do their job, you have, and I said this, and I got so much fucking hate for this, and I said that, you know, a lot of police officers are people who try to do their fucking job, and you know what? I think you can make an argument that because good police officers sometimes protect bad police officers, that makes all of them in that situation bad. And you know what? I'd agree with you. But there are people who are just completely outside of that, who join the force because they want to be a force for good, and they are. And I think that it's so disingenuous to not even say that. It's so fucking unfair to do that. And I think that it serves no purpose other than to unnecessarily divide people and just simply make life worse for everyone. And I, it's really sad to see her defense try to play into that, uh, that predisposition, try to play into that propaganda. Uh, it's bullshit. I've had a lot of friends. They're not all white, by the way. And yeah, they've had some bad experiences with cops before whenever they were being assholes. The overall majority of the police that, uh, you know, I I've ever dealt with and I've ever seen my friends dealt with and they've dealt with in general has been completely fine. I it's been completely fucking fine. And it's important to keep that in mind. That a lot of police officers, like the ones that showed up to that uh, that case there, uh, they try to do their job, they're hardworking people, and they try to do the best they can. Yeah, that that's exactly it. Uh, I've done a lot of shit, dumb shit. Yeah, just be respectful and not a dickhead. Yeah, exactly. My default is don't press, trust the police, but you can't argue with facts. I don't think you should trust them. Like, my best advice, here. here's my advice. Anybody that's dealing with police, comply with the police officer. Try not to be um, uh, vitriolic or, uh, you know, like, like uh, abusive. Try to just do what they ask you to do. Don't be obnoxious. Don't be an asshole. This is their job. They don't want to deal with any bullshit. It's the same as somebody who works at Walmart. Nobody wants to deal with an obnoxious fucking customer. Uh, just, just be a normal person and don't be belligerent. Yeah, just, just try to comply as much as you can. Obviously, you know, if they're asking you to do things that you think violate your rights, of course you ha you're within your rights to, you know, like ask for a lawyer or a legal counsel, etc. But I think most cases that's not really what happens. So yeah, uh, actually defending police, genuinely surprised. Well, I think it's both, right? I, I think that it's important to defend police whenever they do good things and whenever good things are proven to be done by police. And it's also important to hold police accountable whenever bad things are done by police. Because both things and, uh, uh, like, omitting either one of these things is denying reality. That's it. Yeah, that, that's literally all there is to it. And uh, it's, hard, it's hard not to be vitriolic when you get stopped for nothing, you're walking down the street for nothing go, but going to church. No, it's not. No, it's not hard to not be vitriolic for that. Learn to control yourself. You get stopped, and well, now you have to act like a fucking crazy asshole? No, it's not that hard. Yeah, it, it, it's not. Learn some self-control.